Next we have Ileana Medina. Uh, the talk is on evolution of tolerance and host of avian brood parasites and integrated approach. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming. Um, this photograph represents what to me is one of the most interesting interactions in the animal world. There is a tiny bird, another bird, that is feeding a giant chick. The giant chick is a cuckoo and it's a brood parasite. Brood parasites lay their eggs in the nest of other species, their hosts, and it's a very costly behavior for their hosts who have to take care of a usually giant parasitic chick. Brood parasitism is very common in the avian community, and parasitism rates can be as high as 63% within a population, so it is really very, very common. But it's also very common because it's a widespread strategy. Brood parasitism has evolved seven times in the avian biology. It is worldwide distributed. There are African honey guides. We have cuckoos, which are the most famous brood parasites, and they have worldwide distribution. We have uh, a duck in South America, cowbirds in America, and pig or finches in Africa. So it is a widespread strategy. And although all these lineages are considered to be brood parasites, there are differences in how nasty they can be. So honey guides and cuckoos, for example, their cheeks have adaptations to kill all the progeny of the host. Honey guides, their cheeks have uh, hooks at the end of their bills that they use to stab the cheeks that are inside the nest. While the cuckoos, their cheeks have flattened bags, and they use these flattened bags to balance the eggs of the host and evict them from the nest. So these two types of um, brood parasites are considered to be highly virulent. While cowbirds in America and viva finches in Africa are less virulent and the, host, uh, the chicks of these root parasites can be raised side by side with the progeny of the host. So, even, uh, so root parasitism is a very widespread strategy because there are almost 100 species of root parasites. This is also very widespread because there are tons of hosts of root parasites. So there are more than 500 species of passerines that are hosts of root parasites, and there are also woodpeckers and bee eaters that are main hosts of parasites in Africa. So it is really a very important interaction in the avian community. And of course, one of the main questions is how can hosts defend from brood parasitism? It has been tested in several species, in almost 200 actually, that many host species can recognize and evict parasitic eggs based on how they look. So they use cues such as color or egg shape or egg size to detect the parasitic egg and evict it, evict it from the nest. Hosts can also recognize how root parasites look like and they can attack them and try to keep them away from the nest. So this is an example of some African weavers that discovered uh, an African cuckoo trying to lay an egg inside their nest. So this is what we call mobbing. And mobbing and egg rejection are considered to be resistance is strategies. And they are resistance because they completely stop parasitism from happening. So they decrease the, paras uh, the fitness of the parasite. However, there are other ways in which hosts can defend. They can, for example, develop tolerance. Uh, in tolerance strategies, hosts are parasitized, but they decrease the costs of parasitism. So the parasite still gets to reproduce and there is no, no decrease in its fitness but the hosts can decrease the costs of parasitism. And this is a very poorly explored area in avian root parasite theory. And for some years there has been floating the idea that one way of tolerating in hosts of avian root parasites is by evolving a reduced clutch size. And the idea is the following. So let's imagine that we have two birds with different strategies, the gray and the green bird. The gray bird lays a clutch of five eggs, and it lays five, uh, four clutches per season for a total of 20 chicks. While the green bird has a smaller clutch of only four eggs, it lays five ne uh, nests per season for also a total of 20 chicks. So in absence of root parasitism, these two strategies would be equally effective, and they would have 20 chicks at the end of the season. However, if there is a uh, parasitism event by a highly virulent parasite like a cuckoo, then the gray bird, the bird with the gray strategy, would lose <coughs> five eggs and it would have only 15 chicks 
at the end of the season, while the green bird will lose four eggs only for a total of 16 chicks in the season. So if we look at this at first glance, we might think that selection should favor the green strategy because the bird is having more offspring at the end of the season. However, that extra clutch that has been laid by the green bird is also a target of parasitism and can also be parasitizing. <coughs> so if the parasitism rate in this population is of one in four nests, then it's also one in four chances that that extra clutch can be parasitized. And then the extra clutch might have 12, the whole green strategy will have only 12 chicks instead of 16. So taking this into account makes us think that it's not that straightforward, the tolerance is struggling. And we wanted to know whether really this could be happening in nature. So today I'm going to show you very, very briefly the results of a model, and I'm going to focus on a comparative analysis and a field experiment, trying to understand how, uh, whether there is actually uh, an evolution of tolerance by reducing clutch size in hosts of avian bird parasites. So with Hannah Coco, who is my supervisor, my co-supervisor, um, we wanted to know by developing a model how likely would be the evolution of a reduced clutch size in hosts. And today I'm just going to show you very, very briefly that it is not likely at all. So this graph represents some of the parameters, we use more than these ones, but in blue we see the number of cases where it would be um, a higher, it would uh, produce higher fitness to evolve a large clutch, uh, clutch size. And in yellow, the cases where it would be better to have a smaller clutch size. And what we see is that the yellow area is much smaller than the blue one. So there is no support so far, we are still doing this, but so far there is no support for the evolution of tolerance, at least from the model. Now we wanted to know in real life whether there is evidence for actually a, a, a tolerance hypothesis. We wanted to know whether hosts actually have a smaller clutch size than non-hosts. So we collected information on clutch size and on host status all around the world, and we found that not really. So in this graph, we have three categories, non-hosts in blue, hosts of non-virulent parasites, which are the ones that are cowbirds and they don't kill the progeny of the hosts, cowbirds and others. And in red, we see hosts of virulent parasites, which are mainly cuckoos, and what we see is that there is no difference in these three categories, and they have basically the same clutch size in Africa and Europe. In America, we have mainly cowbirds, uh, but still the clutch size is the same between hosts and non-hosts. However, in Australia, there is a very strong difference. And in Australia, hosts of virulent parasites, which are mainly cuckoos, have a much smaller clutch size than non-hosts. And this is true after uh, taking into account phylogenetic controls and taking into account other variables that are known to influence clutch size, such as latitude and body size and nest type. And what we see is that those species that have a smaller clutch size, which is the red in the outer circle, are also more likely to be hosts, which is the red in the inner circle. So this association exists, and this would support the idea that being a host has led to the evolution of a smaller clutch size. However, as you know, comparative analysis don't really tell us much about the causality of things, so it could be actually the other way around. And the tolerance hypothesis would suggest that being a host can lead to a smaller clutch size, but actually maybe having a small clutch size can make a species more prone to become a host. And this is not a crazy idea, because if you remember at the beginning I showed you that these tiny little birds have to be all the eggs that are inside the nest of the host. And it's easy to imagine that for that little bird, it would be much easier to uh, evict less eggs than to evict lots of eggs. So maybe cuckoos are being selected to choose hosts that lay smaller clutches, if this is possible. So we wanted to know, uh, by using a field experiment and with Michelle Hall of the University of Melbourne, we wanted to test whether it was costly for cuckoos to be larger clutches. So we use the system of the super fairy wren, which is the main host of the horse blue bronze cuckoo in Australia. And we wanted to know whether for this cuckoo it would be more costly to evict more eggs than less. So we experimentally changed the number of eggs in the nests of the super fairy wrens. <coughs> and this is 
what we found. So we found no difference. We measured the growth rate of the cuckoos, of the cuckoo chicks, so this is the date after the cuckoo hatch and the weight of the cuckoo. In black, you see the cuckoos, the, the growth rate of the cuckoos that evicted two or less eggs, and in gray, the ones that evicted three or more eggs. And we see that there's no difference. So for these tiny little birds, it is exactly the same to evict one egg or five eggs. And this makes sense because um, these birds, these chicks, the cuckoo chicks, can actually evict chicks. So even if the egg has hatched, they are strong enough to evict chicks from the nest. So with this, we cannot really support the idea that cuckoos selectively target species with smaller clutches. And we cannot reject the tolerance hypothesis, at least in Australia. Maybe in Australia, being a host has really led to the evolution of a smaller clutch. However, the main question now is why would this be happening only in Australia and what is different about the Australian host parasitic system and that makes it so special. So I want to thank my co-authors, my supervisor, Naomi Langmore of the Australian National University, uh, Fong Ling and you. Thank you very much. being harder to evict. The alternative is that a big clutch might have different uh, resource provisioning patterns by the parent. We thought it all about how clutch, does clutch size and pat parent provisioning effort per individual there. I mean, would a parent with a big clutch have a hard time? They have a harder time feeding an extra chick. So I guess that, that yeah, that's true for the parasites that are non virulent, so like cowbirds that raise their eggs, their chicks side by side with, with other nests. But in this case, it would be just one cuckoo chick. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, I think that was first. Oh, uh, I was wondering, um, would it make sense or be possible to uh, evaluate whether having smaller clutches also means you have more clutches per year? That seems like the initial component of your hypothesis, not just smaller clutches, but also repeated, you know. Yeah, yeah, so that's, that should be a basic part of the hypothesis. If they have a reduced clutch size, they should have also more renesting capabilities. Yes. Uh, and that's not, that? uh, we haven't looked at that, but that's included in the model because um, we, we also think that maybe a difference is also the nesting season. So if they have more abilities to renest, that would make a difference between Australia and the other places. We don't have any results yet, but yeah, yeah, that's an important part. So for the, for the Australian example, at least, could this maybe be a detection strategy for the host? Uh, sorry? A detection strategy, having smaller clutches maybe it's easier to detect a parasitic egg. Have you considered that as well? You, having a smaller clutch would be easier for... Easier to detect a, a parasitic egg. I don't know, I'm just going to say Ah, okay, yeah, 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 I understand. So yeah, uh, the number of eggs uh, is related to eviction rate. Uh, and it's hard to in Australia, there is not really much eviction of eggs because the nests are usually very close. So we also think that that's one clue of what it would, could be going on in, in the system. Yeah. So I, would, I think I'm kind of along the same line. So I know that usually the hosts are not able to distinguish which one is the parasitic egg, even though they're larger and the patterns are a little bit different. But could it be that to yeah yeah so that that happens and if, if it's a smaller clutch it might be easier to not work no actually I think there's mixed evidence because if there are too few they don't have like a pattern that they can know that it's theirs so it's harder to compare it with something so I think there's mixed evidence for that but in this case these ones are not the ones that we use for this experiment are 